let's continue with this notion about the mind, body, and the creation of health or disease. Now, if you had a chance to look at your notes, you will notice that there is an article, and it may not be, it may be, it's either in front of or behind this article, something called the Type C Connection. There's an article called Hopelessness Tied to Heart and Cancer Deaths. Yes, do you see that one? Let's take a look at that. In one of our classes that uh, I presented on cardiac health and function and the five aspects of cardiac health, I ran through a whole series of cardiac research. And it started off talking about you know, saturated fats, and it started off talking about atherosclerosis and dealing with narrowing and dealing with you know, all of the mechanical aspects of the heart disease. Then it went on to talk about diet and how diet was connected and lack of exercise and anger and frustration and people not being happy. And it laid out this, you know, the classical kind of evolution of cardiac holistic health. Well, what we saved for the end of the class was the fact that of all the things of all the things, and I know that you know this because you have patients like this that you see every day, of all of the factors that affect heart patients, the biggest factor that affects them is not what we think it is. How many of you have 200, 300, 400 pound patients who have high cholesterol, high insulin, are on medication, they have all kinds of, they've had surgeries or all kinds of problems, and you would say, now that person would be at great risk for cardiac, right? and then have somebody who is really quite different from that without all of those factors who turns around and has a massive heart attack, yes? Do we all see this all the time? Of course we do. There is a factor that is considered to be the key factor in whether or not people can suffer uh, very fatal heart disease. And this article is from Science News. And it says hopelessness, it says bleak expectation about oneself and the future bode ill for physical health. A new study finds men who cite an abiding sense of hopelessness die at higher than average rates from heart disease, cancer, and other causes. This is by an epidemiologist from the Western Consortium for Public Health in Berkeley, California, and her colleagues. It goes on to say we were astonished by these findings. And they go on to talk about the fact that what they did not expect to find was the pervasive and profound effect of hopelessness and despair and how it impacted the physiology of these cardiac patients. Now, right? They were astounded. They were astonished. Other medical people said, that's nonsense. That can't be true. These people have vasoconstriction. These people have atherosclerosis. They've got, you know, all kinds of problems. They've got high blood pressure. They have diabetics. They've got everything, you know, all the setup for you know, heart disease. But these aren't the people that necessarily were dying from heart disease. It was the group that showed the highest state of despair and hopelessness. Now, not only is this true in heart disease and in cancer, as this article goes on to say, but the article that you have, the type C connection, bless you. The Type C Connection, a wonderful, wonderful article. Uh, that uh, This comes out of, um, I'll, you know, it's embarrassing because the name of the journal has been obliterated. It's uh, Noetic Science, a Noetic Science Review. That article talks about the research that this one particular woman did, or I think it was over the course of 12 years, on personality and recovery from cancer. Now, you've all read research articles on visualization, on positive thinking, on guided imagery, and on you know, these many new factors that are being used not only with cancer, but are being used with different diseases. And I'm sure you all have a sense that there is some connection there, isn't there? Of course there is. By the way, do you know that they're now, how many of you heard about they're using uh, hypnosis in the, uh, with anesthesiology at Beth uh, Israel? We're gonna talk about hypnosis and self-hypnosis as well when we get to where we're going. But what we see very clearly, and I also gave you an article uh, from Advances. This is the Fetzer Institute's magazine. 
is hope a treatment for cancer and I also gave you a jacket on a very very important article that I did not uh, make copies of because it was very complex to copy called can the self affect the course of cancer and I happen to have that article I happen to have that magazine with me this is can the self affect the course of cancer this is the article that I gave you the jacket for it said to add to the current state of knowledge regarding possible psychosocial contributions to unexpected cancer survival, I conducted an in-depth, largely qualitative study of 33 individuals who have lived for an extended period of time despite a terminal medical prognosis. For data, I turned to the subjects themselves. I wanted to discover why they believed they had survived. Okay? And it goes on to talk about the the history and the data on these individuals and what the outcome was. The participants seemed intent on accurately and honestly describing what they had experienced and how they had coped so that other facing a similar threat might benefit from anything they had learned. At the same time, they consistently recommended that others find their own path to healing. According to the prognosis of their physicians, none of the participants should have survived to the time of interview. Now, when all was said and done, he gathered all this information and asked, asked the survivors, what did you think? What did you think? What do you believe was the cause of your survival? The fact that you're still around. And 61.2% of them said attitude, group support, and belief system. The changes that had taken place in them from the time they were diagnosed. 31%, they felt 31% of their survival, or 31% of these people, attributed their survival to their treatment, to nutrition, to alternatives, to cancer therapies. Do you find that astounding? When we really look at, and th this is just, it's a brilliant, very long, a research a paper, and I, I hope that they even show the questions and the, you know, the whole thing that went into it. If you're interested, I did make you a copy of the jacket so that you can look it up and you can enjoy that study. The, the point of this is that when we get right down to it, isn't it what is going on internally with that individual that makes a difference as to whether or not that person can get better or not get better? We have people that do remarkably well, that we call them survivors, and we have people that, you know, they tend to kind of just accept it and wait for the inevitable. A lot of what we're looking at has to do with what? Getting back to the mind-body connection. Let's look at thought, personality, emotion, and how we survive, how we are hardwired to survive and to respond to the environment, yes? Any comments? Anybody want to share any of their stories or anything before we take a look at the hardwiring? I bet you guys got great stories, right? I bet you do, don't you? A lot of, lot of survivor stories. Let me use the blue thing. All right, so here we are. We've got, this, we've got this notion that the way that we think and the way that we feel and our value system affects what? Our immune system. Yeah, so let's just put this on there. Immune system. Let's take a look at thoughts feelings, and values, and how these aspects of our unique self, how do they affect the immune system? Now, this is not just about cancer. This is about cancer. This is about chronic disease. This is about heart disease. This is about all of the conditions that you and I, that we're walking around with. You know, healthcare, as I said at the, the uh, beginning of this presentation, the majority of all the healthcare that goes on in this country is not like the work that Michelle does. And Michelle shared with me that she works in, um, you know, in emergency, in, in trauma, in you know, acute care situations where people are clearly, this is not a mind body thing, people, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is not the, let's not do Reiki while they're bleeding, okay? Let's. <laughs> Let's go right to the ER. Let's get right there, okay? You know, it's funny, but we have a lot of uh, 
at our school, we have a lot of people who are very holistically oriented. And we try to say to them, look, there is a time and place for this stuff, okay? You know, if you've got pus and blood, please get out. You know, go right, get right over to the uh, clinic and take care of it. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about what we are walking around with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, that, that chronic condition, that asthma, that arthritis, that colitis, that digestive disturbance, you know, that, that low thyroid function, all of the things that, you know, the multi-trillion dollar pharmacological industry is, uh, you know, is, is serving. So we're hypothesizing that, uh, in fact, the thoughts and the feelings and the values that we carry around with us every single day are somehow communicating and articulating and going up and saying, listen, let's talk. Okay? This is what we're doing. It, I, I like to think of, you know, you have to think of your mind body as like two women having coffee or tea. See, I go right into my New York accent, okay? <laughs> you know, you're sitting down and you say, look, this is how it is. I'm going to tell you the truth, right? Your mind is very much a confidant with your body. And the way that it does that, unfortunately, it doesn't have a telephone, but what it does is it has its own wiring and its own communication. You know, if I have something that I want to say to my sister, I call her up on the phone, right? Well, the brain is no different than me and my sister. The brain and the body, they got their own thing going. So what happens here is if I have a thought or a feeling, my thought or my feeling, let me see my thought or my feeling. Okay, what, what will I come up with? <gasps> oh, <clears throat> I'm never going to get out from under. How many of you, right? Oh, I'll never, there'll never be enough time. There'll never be enough time. I'm never going to relax. I can't relax. I'm never going to be able to, you know, have an easy time of it. What are these thoughts doing that will ultimately cause my immune system to, re to react? Oh, that's so noisy. Okay. We have a thought. Now, remember that thoughts are things. Thoughts are things. What does that mean? A th what? I'm sorry? They're, and how are they real? What makes them real? Thoughts are what? They're chemicals. Okay? Everything in the human body is a what? It's a chemical reaction, isn't it? It's a biochemical happening. <laughs> Thoughts are neurotransmitter, polypeptides, peptides. They are protein chemical complexes that are produced in the cortex, in the brain, and they communicate to the rest of the brain. Yes? Did we see that in the, the first half of the class? So let's say I have a thought. Okay, let's do, um, let's do uh, heart disease. Okay, heart disease. What, what's the source of heart disease? Really, if you, if you, heart disease, broken heart, right? I mean, broken heartedness, hopelessness, right? Did we hear about that? So let's take a look at broken heart. If I have a broken heart, and, and what's going on in my head constantly over and over again? There's sadness, right? Is it two Ds or one? Uh-oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I messed up on that one, okay. So we've got sadness. Maybe we have depression. Maybe we have hopelessness. Maybe we have despair. I am going to be creating, I'm going to be generating proteins in my brain that are going to do what? What's going to happen to those proteins that are in my brain? Where are they going to go? They're going to go to my limbic system, are they not? Right? Isn't that what happens? Frontal cortex to the locus ceruleus to the limbic system. So what's going to happen when it gets to the limbic system? It's going to integrate memory and emotion. Here we are. My whole life, all of my memories, you know, I've never been loved the way I wanted to be loved. Everything I ever loved dies. You've heard people say these things, right? I can't get love, right? <laughs> The, and what about us girls? I'll never find the right man, right? How many of you said that? Oh, where, where is he? Where's Prince Charming? Young women. Do you know, in my office, I get all these young girls, and they're like 26, 28, and they're, oh, you know, it's never going to happen for me. 
right? We all know that unfortunately they're not going to get away without suffering. They're going to marry. <laughs> I say to them, I say, do you think, do you think you're going to escape? 96% of all human beings marry. I said, why should you not marry a man and suffer like the rest of us? <laughs> God didn't make it that way. Women suffer, men marry. You know, this is the way it is. Okay. Bruce, you didn't hear that. Okay. Look, I told you, I got to have some material, right? You know, you, you got to keep it light. Anyway, so we've got all of these things going on, right? The protein, it's like, it, it's like every time you think the same thought, what you're doing is you're creating a chemistry. That chemistry is getting communicated into the limbic system that, what does it do? It anchors, it anchors that feeling, right? How many of you have heard a song or watched a movie or seen somebody and all of a sudden you get that re-stimulation of that feeling that you had for whatever reason that was maybe sad or what have you? We're constantly living off of the limbic system's response to stimuli. It's called unique stimuli. And so what happens is if I'm thinking all the time, I can't get loved, I can't find love, I'm so unhappy, I've lost the love of my life, I'm despair, and this, we really see this when people lose their significant others, and that's, that's not a funny thing. I mean, when somebody loses their partner, you know, their spouse of many years, and you'll see the depression that will take over, or the sadness, or the loss, and I'm sure you know statistically that one to two years after loss and grief, breast cancer or other cancers are very common to occur, yes? Well, we're going to see exactly why and how that happens. But what we know are these thoughts constantly bathing into the limbic system. What's the limbic system going to do with those things? It's going to communicate. Remember, hypothalamus, limbic, pituitary, adrenal. Yes? That is solid, well-known stuff. What is that going to do to your body? Look at Selye's chronic stress chart. And what's going to happen is there's going to be a suppression of the immune system, a suppression of the nutrient system through the digestive system. What's going to happen is there are going to be specific transducers called specific neuropeptides that are created with depression, sadness, loss, grief, anger, whatever, that are going to find their way because they have an affinity for cell membranes of the immune system. This work is out of Candace Pert's work. I'm sure you've all heard of Candace Pert. Brilliant stuff, and and her book is on the reading list. This is the very latest neurotransmitter research that these neurotransmitters are specific to the thoughts you think, and that those specific chemicals communicate and articulate with the cell membrane. When they enter into the cell membrane, here it is, get ready, get ready, it's coming, it's so exciting. See, here's the cell. When you have these little chemicals, right, these little doo-doos that are going, they make their way to the cell membrane. They know the code, you see? They know how to get in. So they get into the cell membrane, and guess what else they do? They get into the DNA of the cell. For more information about the National Institute of Whole Health and their accredited professional continuing educational programs, go to www.wholepersonhealthcare.org.